Hey, YouTube friends and Instagram live friends. Um, I'm back for my weekly studio stream after a brief hiatus, and I'm so excited to welcome you back into my uh, live open studio time. Today, I have several things that I'll be working on. Let me get situated. Um, I have several things that I'll be working on. Um, and the first is going to be familiar to those of you who may have attended previous studio streams. I'm finally, finally finishing up this lovely straw Regency bonnet reproduction that I've been making for several weeks, actually at this point several months. Um, I've finally settled upon what the trim's going to be, so the first project today that I'll be working on is stabilizing that. Um, again, on IGTV, you have the portrait uh, view, and you don't get quite as broad of a view of my work table as you do on YouTube. And um, one of my regular uh, viewers, Arlene, will often sign on in both places so, because uh, she prefers uh, to have the option of both views depending upon what I'm working on. So just so you know, you just get a better perspective on this project, especially a bonnet as large as this straw bonnet happens to be um, in the YouTube window. So I have a, a silk ribbon here that is placed on the bonnet where I want to um, stabilize it. I'm not gonna do a whole lot of stitches um, holding it down. I'm really just, um, well, I think one of my mentors in millinery once said that, you know, you, you don't want to put any more stitches into a hat in stabilizing the trim that you absolutely need to have. Oop, I just had my, this is a new uh, spool of thread, but the label just came off of the end just now. Um, this is actually a, a piece of spool of thread that was given to me by, I'm gonna have to take my glasses off to see this because I have poor up close and far away vision in different ways. Aging is so difficult. Um, anyway, this thread that I'm gonna be using was actually given to me by a colleague back at the beginning of the pandemic when, um, what I was doing at the time was stitching a lot of masks for various charities um, and, and, and local aid organizations who were then distributing them um, to communities in need, either through like food banks or churches or um, aid organizations. And anyway, I, I was doing a lot of sewing on behalf of those kinds of organizations. And um, I, several friends and colleagues here in the Triangle, which my studio is in Durham, North Carolina in the United States, if you're joining me from abroad, um, several of my colleagues wanted to support the work that I was doing in the form of donations. And, and often it would be a case where someone uh, would have a lot of fabric or thread that they had just sort of kept for a while in some sort of stash in their home and they wanted to contribute it to the effort that I was undertaking in making these masks. And this peach thread that I'm using right now to sew on or tack down the silk ribbon to this vintage, it's uh, not vintage, it's a re reproduction, Regency bonnet, was part of one of those donations. Uh, at this point, I've actually, uh, my work at the theater and at the university has resumed to the point that I no longer have the amount of um, time to devote to mask construction as I did at one time. And I actually just packed up a donation of some of the stuff that was given to me at the time to pass on to um, a local group that I had been working with when I 
was um, involved in sewing as much as I was. And, and the group still exists, and they're still manufacturing um, stitched fabric face masks for underserved populations. And so the, the fabrics and the threads that I did not use, um, I've packed it up to pass on, packed some of them up to pass on to them. I, I admit I selfishly kept this spool of peach thread because it so perfectly matches my ribbon that I at least wanted to use it for this task. And maybe I'll pack it up and, and send it on in a future donation um, that I hand off to them. That um, the group that the group that I that I used to sew with is called the Bull City Mask Mavens and uh, Mask Mavens, and that's run by a woman here in Durham. But I believe that they at this point have partnered with a larger group here in the Triangle area um, called Face Mask Warriors. <laughs> That's, that's what I had to put on the donation that got picked up this morning. Um, so this ribbon that I'm in the midst of tacking onto this bonnet here, um, my goal is to actually only tack it in um, two places on each side of the bonnet where, let me put this on my head and illustrate. So if the bonnet, sits on the wearer's head like this and the ribbons tie it under your chin. The goal is to stabilize it right here at the edge where the ribbon breaks away from the straw um, but lets it remain unstitched over the crown of the bonnet here. Um, just because, again, I always think back to, to what that mentor said about minimizing the amount of stabilization stitching that you do on a bonnet or any piece of millinery um, to only what's required for the stability of the piece um, so that it doesn't look overworked and heavy-handed and um, I, I think that's a good piece of advice and it's it's one that I tend to observe and it's, it's one that I pass on to my students when I'm teaching millinery at the university, which I, if you've been attending this stream long term, then um, you remember that that was the class that I taught remotely for the first time ever last, uh, in this fall semester, last semester. And that um, turned out successfully. I, I mean, I, the, the students all made beautiful hats and, and my impression is that they learned quite a bit about making good quality hats for the stage and, and good quality hats in general. Like there's the, the difference between a hat for the stage and a hat for fashion purposes, I guess, is that a hat for the stage often needs to stand up to things that you would hope a piece of fashion millinery never has to stand up to. Like it gets kicked across the stage in anger every night <laughs> or someone sits on it and and it's a comedy moment where this beautiful hat gets crushed um, and so you have to take some things into consideration that you otherwise would never have to um, but that's last semester's class this semester um, I'm in the midst of teaching dyeing and surface design also remotely, thanks to the pandemic. And um, that's actually going quite successfully too, I think. The, the students are able to sign up for access to the dye facility and, and use the industrial equipment that we have there. Um, and so largely the lessons that I, I, I filmed some stuff. Oh, hi, I see Kim has joined over on Instagram television. Hi, Kim. Welcome, welcome. Kim is a milliner here in Chapel Hill, where the university is located that I teach at. And actually, Kim, I was just thinking of you earlier today and writing about you because um, one of my graduate students, a, a woman named Athena Wright, has been engaged in a long-term research project of uh, 
testing out the process by which you might scan an antique blocked hat of a given style and retroactively engineer the block from which it must have been created and then replicate that block using uh, contemporary computer technology like a CDC router and you know can you carve a hat can you carve a vintage hat block on a router that conforms to the shape of a hat that you might find and, and Kim was involved in this research because she had this beautiful and very well preserved uh, antique 1940s hat that she had found um, perhaps at a junk shop or an antique mall uh, maybe she'll comment in the chat on IGTV and, and let us know where that hat came from. It came from somewhere, um, like a vintage dealer, and um, she wanted the block that it was made on to be able to make further hats in that style of her own design, um, being a milliner, as you know, or as I have said. And um, so she loaned it to us, and, and Athena was able to 3D scan it, and then... Um, go through a pretty convoluted process to to divide it up into layers and carve it on a shop bot um and we just wrote that up for publication in uh, a, a journal called the theater design and journal of theater design and technology and so i was just proofreading and 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 correcting the last draft of that that does make mention of kim and also um a woman named Sally Coyle, who is a digital fabricator consultant and an artist um, that met with Athena to, to, to troubleshoot how, like, here's the thing that we need to make. How can we use digital technologies to make it? And, and she was very helpful as well. So that was a, a lovely treat today to be reminded of, of these collaborators on this piece of research that has been so long in the making. Um, and, and that we're now finally being able to publish. And we actually, we're, we're publishing the article as I edited it today. Um, that one is, is aimed, as I said, at the, the readership of theater design and technology, which is um, a juried publication that's attached to um, the trade organization for technical theater practitioners, USITT. Um, which USITT has actually been having their national conference this week um, virtually. And um, as a matter of fact, my program head is attending it right now to answer questions people might have about our graduate program. Um, but in addition to having written this article for TDNT, which has the, uh, the, the readership is uh, theater technicians, so some of them will be costumers who may be familiar to some degree with the hat blocking process, um, but but you also may have a readership of, of people who are you know stage hands or scenic carpenters and and so the, the the way that we have explained we've had to explain the process a little bit more in depth of like when you block a hat you need something called a hat block and here's why. Um, and we're also planning to write up a, a little bit more um, milliner centric version of the, the research and the paper for Hat Talk magazine, which is based in the UK. And um, they're attached to, I believe that they are uh, somehow attached to Guy Moore's Hat Blocks, which is a hat block carver um, in the UK. Um, and, and so in, in I'm gonna to have to re-edit this article for that publication. And, and in that case, the readership is the, you know, largely contemporary milliners who are very familiar with the blocking process because if they subscribe to Hat Talk, then chances are they have bought or want to buy hat blocks from Guy Morse. So they know all about what blocks are and all about also how much um, craftsmanship and labor really goes into the construction of a, a contemporary hat block in terms of its carving and how much knowledge that that woodworker needs to have in order to make a useful piece and you know it so the the there are 
elements of the article in this draft that I just edited today that won't be necessary for the re-edited version in Hat Talk because of the education level of the readership in terms of millinery processes. So, you know, these, these are all uh, probably, if you, don't, um, if you don't have any excuse or reason to um, publish in any kind of market, whether academic journals or contemporary uh, magazines and so forth, like if, if, you've, if you've never had a uh, reason to compose something for one of these uh, publications, then this is probably stuff that you're like, wow, I never really thought about that. How, you know, you, you have to tailor what you write to the readership that you intend to have. And, and that has been really, um, you know, in working with Athena on this, like she was very passionate about the, the research that was happening and learning the technologies and, and, and all of that stuff. But it's also been really great for her to um, to see how the same article has to change depending on who wants to publish it. Um, now, and as so far as I know, like we pitched this to both of these markets and, and received interest. Like they're both like, yes, we want to read this. We probably want to publish this. So, you know, it, I, I, I don't have a, a publication date that I could share with you because I think that there are so many factors that go into that that are I'm not privy to um, but I, I can say that if if this article sounds interesting to you there will be two places that you could read about this research uh, depending upon whether you um, think you can get your hands on a copy of Hat Talk or a copy of Theater Design and Technology um, so I have come to the end of my, I just need to knot off this thread here, and then I have tacked my lovely silk ribbon in all four of the places that I planned to in terms of the finishing for this hat, and the last step before this hat is, before I'm going to consider this hat done, because um, this is not for a stage show. I don't have a, a costume designer who needs to sign off on this. I am the designer in this case. And in fact, you know, if you recall from the beginning, or, or for, for those of you who have not been here from the beginning, uh, this was initially sort of an, a, an exercise that I started mid-pandemic just to, in part, just to have a, a, a millinery project that I was working on during my studio stream for what was at the time my millinery students to be able to sign on and watch me work if they wanted to the way that they would be able to if we were all, you know, able to able to make costumes for the theater in the same space, which we can't do under COVID because of, uh, because of capacity restrictions. So I, I started making this. I had just received a donation of this beautiful, um, and it, this was an antique straw hat that was very damaged in the sideband, had splits and cracks. But I was able to salvage this medallion that was in the tip of the hat, and I, I used it as inspiration, plus some donated lengths of this natural straw braid that composes the rest of the hat to just illustrate the process of creating a, a spiral straw hat because that is a very particular kind of millinery construction that I, uh, I talk about it with them, but in the class that I teach, it's not a topic that we cover per se. Um, I've had a couple of students who came to the class with significant millinery experience who elected to do a spiral straw hat as one of their projects just because they already knew how to block straw in the traditional way. Um, So I started this to demonstrate to them how you could uh, 
create this bonnet and I found a um, an, an image of an extant bonnet that survived from the Regency period to, to, to gauge the shape of this thing because it is it's a, a very unusual shape and it's a shape we talked about this the fact that the depth of the, this bonnet brim is so deep that you would never have this uh, for a stage production, you know, if, if, well, we have done at Playmakers, the theater where I work, we've done dramatizations of Pride and Prejudice and Sense and Sensibility, both of which have bonnets in them, but none of them had bonnet brims this deep because the stage lights cannot get in there. Um, but this, this extant bonnet that I found, it was this deep and um, I wanted to make it, I wanted to make it according to that historical research uh, just because as a theatrical milliner that these are like tricks that you use that you have to use for stage production you shorten the depth of this brim and I would probably if I'm making it for playmakers it probably stop about right here and so that they could light the actor's face who was wearing this and the same is often true in film you know you you need to see the faces of the performers um, because that's, you know, they're often this star talent draw to why people want to see this show. Um, and, and the whole point of these bonnets is that they, they really obstruct your peripheral view, that you're, you really feel like you're down in a tunnel when you have one of these things on. Um, the reason that I chose, see, I have a, a little straw flower here that I now need to place on this and, and consider it done. Um, and in fact, I have, when I sewed the layers of this straw flower together, I, I left the, the thread and the needle. I, I didn't tie it off. I just sort of came to a point and, and made a knot to stabilize it, but left this thread in here so that I could use just, I guess, kind of out of um, sustainability or whatever. Like, a, like why thread up a new needle when you already have one threaded up and you can just use it to sew this whole thing on. Um, so I'm going to be using this to sew the whole thing on. The reason that I chose a Regency bonnet in the first place which I need to be very careful here while I do this so that I don't catch any of the things. Okay, the reason that I chose a Regency bonnet in the first place is because I'm giving a lecture. It's a, it's a, a lecture for, I guess it's called a lifelong learning program. It's, um, predominantly retirees, you know, uh, folks who are in a position to, to just be able to take classes and attend lecture series um, just on topics that, that interest them. And um, so it's typically, as I gather from the people who engaged me to do this, it's typically senior citizens, um, some of whom who live in retirement communities and in normal times, I would be giving this talk in person in um, a theater down in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, because of the pandemic, that's not happening. But um, uh, the reason I'm getting back to this, I guess, now this week on the studio stream is because I, I finally um, I finished the PowerPoint for that lecture. It's not until April, but you know, I, I just, I guess I, I got a donation of a, a reproduction bonnet from the era and I, I just was inspired to finish that lecture because I had some beautiful hats to include photographs of in it. And um, let's see if I'm, I've got this positioned well. Yes, I do. I do have it where I want it to be. Let me, let me spin it around here and show you before I tie it off. But this is a little 
floral ornament that I created using both types of straw that comprise the rest of the bonnet to create the petals and the stamens of the flower. It's got some little crystals on brass wires in the middle there. Um, and a green leaves that this is actually a, a, a reproduction antique ribbon um, I mean by which I mean it's not actually antique it's a reproduction of an antique ribbon style um, that that comprised the leaves here and this is just a little little piece of fruit to add to the the adornment of this bonnet I think the the shape is is so lovely all on its own that I, I don't even though a lot of bonnets from the time have a whole bunch of frippery all over them, um, I, I didn't want to just plaster this with a whole garden worth of flowers um, because it is such a, a sophisticated and unusual shape. But I wanted there to be something... Oh, it's hard to see down inside of here. I wanted there to be something just to give it a little bit of adornment. Okay, I might need a curved needle for this. Because, uh, yeah, well, I'll give it a try. So I finished my, my PowerPoint and this week I had an appointment with the people who who um, sort of come up with these lifelong learning things um, to test out the Zoom because <laughs> I guess some of the, the folks participating um, are not very, do not feel that confident with video conferencing software. You know, of course, I'm like, I've been teaching college classes on Zoom since a year ago, so I'm, I'm good here, but I, I still met with them because I, I wanted to assure everyone that I'm capable of using the software that I need to use to do my lecture. Um, and that also was really inspiring. You know, it was nice to meet the people who are coordinating this and um, see that they're very excited about the content that, um, uh, that I had created in my PowerPoint. And so I, I really just wanted to finish up this bonnet um, once and for all, so that I could photograph it and finish that uh, PowerPoint for that lecture in August. So here we go. Well, I'll hold it up so you can see. It's done now. Oh, I meant to set a timer so that I would know when my stream was over. I, <laughs> It's been a while. I, I didn't stream last week uh, because we are deep in the midst of the process of, let me put this aside, we're in the midst of the process of, of interviewing applicants to our graduate program. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of fast and furious right now. We have so many really well-qualified applicants that, um, that has preempted my stream. Um, it, it preempted it last week, and then I, I streamed the week before, but then it preempted it for like three of the Thursdays in February. We are coming to the end of that process though, so hopefully that sort of professional con conflict will be uh, not, a uh, not a problem in the future, but who knows? We'll see. So I'm going to move on to my next project that I, I had to put aside to do in today's studio stream. And um, you may recognize this one from a couple of, uh, of streams ago as well. So this is a series of, of color swatch infinity scarves that I'm creating. Um, and this first one that's actually almost finished except for do you I discovered this do you see that error in the print this is a spoon flower design which is a, a digital textile printer here in Durham North Carolina um, 
And I, I have some designs up on there as well. And I have certainly been contacted with this sort of issue in the past on my own designs. So I certainly sympathize with the designer of this that um, sometimes there is a, a, a small element, usually of a, a, a white artifact in your design that doesn't show up until you print it because it's like one pixel high. And so I, I know what has happened here, but it, it doesn't mean that I want there to be a, a white square in the middle of what's supposed to be a black color swatch on this scarf. So the first thing I'm doing for all of these, um, there are four of them because this is a set of um, scarves that I'm making as gifts for my graduate students who are um, who are graduating this year, which to be perfectly honest, I don't actually expect any of the third years to watch this studio stream because they're all frantically trying to finish their graduate degrees. And so most of them do not have the spare time to just sit and watch me work when they are actually working on so many things themselves. Um, that said, if any of my third year graduate students are watching this right now, I guess I just spoiled you for what part of what your graduation gift is. Um, so I'm coloring out that error in the print, which, you know, I have gotten notifications from Spoonflower that they discovered there was an error in the print when somebody ordered one of my designs and then it started to come off the printer and they were like, whoa, that's not supposed to be there. Um, I think I already corrected this one. Um, nope, nope, I did not. And so sometimes they get in touch with the, the original designer of the art and say, hey, you've got an artifact in your design. You need to get rid of it. Um, and, and I have really appreciated that because it's, it's often something that, that I don't see it, you know, and I wouldn't see it unless I printed it out at high definition the way that they, they print the textiles in the factory. Um, There we go. But when I received these and noticed that this was an issue, I did not reach back out to Spoonflower and try to get them to reprint me a new version because I'm a theater costumer and I understand how to correct things like this. Um, you, know, you in the theater, you often don't have the time. If some, if somebody if you receive something that's got a misprint or an error in it, um, especially a custom print from a company like Spoonflower, where, you know, if you send in a complaint about it, then you suddenly have um, another, like, two weeks onto your production time to wait while they reprint it, that if you can find a satisfactory way to, to fix it yourself, um, that's often a thing that you do. And, and permanent markers, I'm I won't say I'm often called upon to, to color over these kinds of, of print error artifacts, um, but this is definitely not my first time doing it. <laughs> so, you know, it happens. And, and permanent laundry markers in various colors is uh, one way to deal with it. And so I decided in making these scarves, it's and not really on the kind of like theater level crunch time that I would be um, for stage costumes because, you know, these students are like they're graduating this year, but that's not till I believe graduation this year for our university is May 22nd, I think. I'm slip stitching um, this scarf and the remaining two scarves. Um, when you sew these infinity scarves together, you, you have to leave a little opening to turn them inside out, and then you have to slip stitch that opening closed. Um, and I'm, I'm doing that before I move on to the next one. Um, I do not have four graduate students, though. I'm making four of these scarves because you can't order a partial yard um, from a custom printer. Um, well, 
that's not entirely true, but let's just let's just pretend that that is entirely true um, because I didn't want to jump through the kind of hoops that I would have needed to jump through to order a partial yard when what I actually wanted was if I have three graduate students, which I do, and the I need a half yard for each of these infinity scarves, then if I order two yards, I have enough to actually make one for myself as well. Um, what I love about this print, why I chose it for these particular graduate students, is that it is, it isn't a set of color swatches for like a Pantone set of, of decor color swatches. It's not that, but it's reminiscent of it. It's like a stylized version of the color swatches that you get um, as a theatrical dyer or as a, a print textile designer. And, and I thought that was, that was a nice uh, thing to evoke. And among this class of three graduating grad students, um, they all were really successful in, um, in my dye class, which is normally um, first and second year grad students. So I said, I'm teaching it this semester, but none of all of these third year graduating students have already had it two years ago. Um, and they all did a great job in it. And then so much so that um, two of them are, are using sig significant dyeing and surface design techniques in their capstone projects. Um, and then the third one who, she, it kind of depends, she may wind up using some surface design and dyeing projects in her capstone as well. It's not on the table right now, but you know, sometimes things come up and you can't find what you need in the right color, so you have to dye it. So um, I, I, I don't say that that's entirely impossible for the third of these students, but right now she has no plans for that. But she um, majored in fine arts as an undergrad and has a, a really good eye for color. And so that's why I chose this this print because it seemed like something that was evocative of the aesthetic personalities of all of these graduate students. Um, and I look forward to owning a, a scarf out of this material as well. Um, I have another scarf that is similarly reminiscent of the color swatch rainbow. Um, that I sometimes wear uh, in colder times. It's warmer now. How about that? Um, it it has it, because of the pandemic. I guess it's felt like it's been twelve months of winter, which it really hasn't at all. Um, it's just that last spring and summer was as the pandemic lockdown was getting started, and things were very dire. And so you know because I was cleared to teach from home and my partner was also um, encouraged to, well, required to work from home by his employer. Um, we just really didn't leave the house for like 10 months other than for, you know, medical emergencies and, and dentistry and stuff. Um, where's the white squares on this one? Ooh, did I already finish? I feel like one of these I did already finish. And I think it is this one. Yes, yes. Yes, yes, this is one I already finished. I just need to stitch up the hole in it. What are we doing for time? Oh, 337. I'm doing good. I actually, I'm getting better at planning exactly how much work I can get done in one of these studio streams. Like I thought, the bonnet is actually not enough for a whole stream, you know, but these other, uh, these scarves, there's, there's minimal amount of work on them. And I thought, I bet I could get those four scarves and the bonnet done in the studio stream today, which is fully an hour. I have to apologize that the last studio stream that I did have, which was not last week, but was the week before, um, I only streamed for 20 minutes because we had a last minute, um, meeting called at the theater. Um, it was not anything drastic. It was um, 
this ongoing um, racial equity, diversity, access, and inclusion uh, training that the theater has been undergoing uh, for many months now. And, and there are several installments, and this was the most recent installment of that that got scheduled. Um, and preempted my studio stream, which is fine. Um, that's important work needs to be done. So I'm down to stitching shut my last of the four infinity scarves, perhaps the one that will be mine someday. I had, um, I had a, a really exciting meeting earlier this, earlier this week. It was actually Tuesday of this week, I believe. Well, Tuesday for me. Um, it was, uh, there's a, a man who is a fellow milliner and a fellow YouTuber. Um, he, his YouTube channel is JWH Millinery, and he is currently based in Australia. He's a, actually a British citizen, but um, he and his partner have moved to Australia coincidentally and wonderfully for them directly before this pandemic. So they, they moved from a, a nation that maybe is not, has not been doing the greatest job at containing the pandemic to a continent that has done a fantastic job of dealing with the pandemic. Anyway, so um, I think his name is James. Um, he reached out to me on Instagram about um, trying to set up a, 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 a group of um, YouTube milliners or milliners who have YouTube channels and, and to just, you know, to just sort of brainstorm and bounce ideas off of one another and, and empathize with one another's concerns about running one of these channels and um and and maybe come up with ways to to collaborate and support one another in interesting ways and so he set up this um zoom conference that for him it was seven o'clock in the morning the next day and for me it was three o'clock in the afternoon so it was like tuesday at three for me and it was 7 a.m on wednesday for him so that was kind of cognitive dissonance and, um, but it was really nice to meet him. I've certainly seen several of his videos. Um, it was nice to meet him and, and talk in real time over that video call about, you know, just the, the travails of running a millinery related channel, which, you know, of course I just dropped a pen. Hang on. I have to find it or else possibly just not find it and step on it later. Okay. <laughs> That'll be unpleasant. Um, but I was talking about um, this meeting with James and, and I hope that's his name. I'm going to feel so bad when the video of this channel, of this stream goes up if that's not his name. I just know him as JWH Millinery. So, and anyway, um, one thing that we came up with though um, in talking about uh, how as milliners we could strategize ways to collaborate and support one another as content creators um, i mentioned that since i'm a theatrical milliner slash costumer that i'm also involved with a group called costube which is youtubers who costume and not just theatrically, but also a lot of people who do historical reenactment and historical sewing and, and you know, vintage lifestyle sewing and stuff like that. And um, those channels are, are super popular now. I think, you know, like they have, some of them have millions of subscribers. And um, I'm telling, uh, this guy about how I'm also a part of that group and and discussed how uh, the youtuber the youtubers of costume collaborated with the costume industry coalition um, for a, a fundraiser to support the costume shops of Broadway who have been closed since March 2020 um, where 
the CIC released a digitized version, a downloadable version of a pattern from Hamilton, the musical. And you can download that on Etsy and sew your own version of this beautiful Spencer jacket that was created for the Hamilton musical designed by the designer of Hamilton, Paul Taswell. And um, then they partnered with these costumers whereby these really successful, famous historical sewing artists used the pattern to create their own versions of these historically accurate Spencer jackets. And they documented it on their channel. And then that really just boosted the sale of that pattern, which uh, it comes in uh, the full range of sizes from, I think, like size zero smallest person to like, I think the biggest one that I think it's 22W that is the, the largest size that they graded it up to. Um, anyway, so the Hamilton jacket challenge has become like a thing among all of these different costume challenge uh, channels where you have different artists with different personalities and different aesthetic tastes making their own versions of these Hamilton patterns. And um, it's, it's been just fantastic in terms of boosting the Etsy sales of that pattern um, to support the costume industry who are still um, not in not really in operation on Broadway and and I'm telling uh, I'm talking about this in the millinery uh, zoom with the guy from JWH millinery and and he was like oh that's really that's really exciting that's really interesting you know he follows a couple of these folks um, and he's like oh, we should come up with something like that 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 would um, tie into an existing musical you know, but, but, but not Hamilton because like, he was like, I'm not a huge fan of Hamilton. I was like, I'm not also a huge fan of, uh, like, I'm not anti Hamilton. I just don't like walk around singing the lyrics and stuff, you know, like we watched it when it, when they broadcast it during the pandemic on, um, I think Disney plus, um, we watched it and it's a good musical. And I, I mean, I worked on the women's ensemble when I was in New York one summer so, you know, I do have a personal connection to it, but, but I don't feel like as inspired by it as obviously many of these costumers who were signing on to make these Spencer jackets were. And so in talking to him about what, what kind of, what could we take our inspiration from? It came up that he and I both are huge fans of the musical, the problematic musical <laughs> Phantom of the Opera, which you know, as an adult, I now realize that that's like about psychological abuse and sexual harassment. But at the time, it seemed really romantic as a teenager. And the music is fantastic. So, and, and he and I both were like, yes, Phantom is so awesome and opulent costumes and, you know, spooky, creepy guy with the mask and all that. And we were like, oh, you know, Phantom of the Opera is about to have a 35th anniversary. The, the, the musical opened in the London West End in October of 1986. And it opened in New York uh, a couple of years later, I think 1988. And, and has been continually running since, except for the pandemic. And so, you know, the, the 35th anniversary, it... it it remains to be seen whether the British government and population will get the virus under control enough to where they can have a 35th anniversary performance. I believe it's October 6th or the 8th. It's, it's a single digit date. Um, but, but regardless, it, 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 there are definite plans for it to reopen all over the world where it had been running pre pandemic. I actually think it has reopened in Australia. Um, and, and so as theater mounts back up to, to reopening globally, you know, we had decided that what we wanted to do was create a phantom inspired challenge where either you are making a reproduction of a hat or headdress from the musical or you create something that is inspired by it. So I share that with you, people who are watching this right now, um, 
that if you would like to join the Phantom 35 challenge that um, JWH Millinery and I are putting together, I'm actually writing it up and, and I'm going to try to get the, the historical costume YouTubers on board with it as well. Um, because I think that would be um, just a, a fun uh, tribute to, to theater as a medium, as, as an art, and, and to a, a, a really highly significant piece at the end of the 20th century into the 21st. Um, how, whatever you think about it, problematic. And I see that Kim has a comment in YouTube. She says, I listened to the Phantom Cast recording on my Walkman. <laughs> <laughs> in high school yes I did too like I was in high school when that first hit you know and and I um oh and somebody else is saying that sounds fun yes join us join us it does sound fun doesn't because we were brainstorming like the whole rest of our zoom call was like oh you know like the phantom mask is so iconic like there's there's the two eye mask that is in the logo but then the actual phantoms mask is like a half face mask over one eye and we were talking about how there are all those hat designs that philip tracy and stephen jones came out with where there's a mask element of them and they cover up part of the face and you know we were like oh you could you could run with that idea of the hybridization of mask and hat and, you know, be inspired by all of the opulence of opera that is there in, uh, really in the background almost of Phantom of the Opera. You know, it, it just, it was so much fun. And, and it got, uh, like Kim says, I used to listen to the score of that thing. Like I had the cast album and I listened to it nonstop all the time. Like played it on my uh, juke, not jukebox, but boombox played it on my boombox I had it on cassette and then I had it on CD and you know like all the music just came back to me as we were talking about this and I was like oh, I'm so inspired by the things that we might create so what we decided the challenge is is you come up with a design a hat a costume piece whatever um, that is inspired by Phantom or maybe you copy one from either the musical or the film or you know described in the book and in YouTube purposes you know for for he and I not necessarily for those of you who are watching I don't know how many of you might also have a YouTube channel or um, a, a series on IGTV or whatever um, but that then it, that would be the excuse to create some content about it the making of your phantom inspired headdress or hat or costume garment whatever um, and then we could all release them in October when the 35th anniversary will be being, will be being celebrated. So we'll see. I've already seen that uh, travel agencies are, are putting together packages around this idea where you can travel to somewhere where hopefully, theoretically, Phantom will be running for its 35th anniversary and watch the, sh you know, you'll get tickets to the show and you'll get a posh hotel and, and you know, it's, it's a big package and stuff. Um, Oh, somebody says, uh, my millinery skills are subpar, but I might have to try. It doesn't matter if you if you aren't ha confident in your millinery skills. It's it's about making the cool thing inspired by the uh, inspired by the musical. So I'm sure that what you make will be awesome. <laughs> I mean, how can it not like music of the night? Hello. That's such a good song. <laughs> you know, I, I listen to. I listened to that mu that uh, soundtrack and watched that musical as an adult and was was really kind of disturbed by the content of it because I'm like, this is like really stalker behavior. Like if somebody began, I remember thinking that it was so romantic as a teenager, and now I'm like, wow, if somebody started acting like that to me, I would be freaking out. <laughs> Oh, somebody's calling me on my phone and has... Sorry, somebody called me on my phone and just preempted my video, even though I, I'm not going to talk to somebody right now. <laughs> I think I only have like five minutes left anyway, I believe. Well, um, seven minutes, just under seven minutes. So 
the Phantom of the Opera 35th Anniversary Challenge, whether it's via YouTube or just um, something to inspire you in the artwork or, that you create, um, is something that, that we're putting together. And, and if nothing else, then on my YouTube channel and on J JWH Millinery channel, we'll have videos that we release about whatever it is that we create. I kind of had a... Um, inspired by partly by phantom and how you know so many of the scenes have all these supernumeraries in the background from the operas that are happening that christine is starring in but the, the over-the-top nature of opera co costume in general and the fact that a friend of mine is downsizing her tiara collection which let me assure you is prodigious um i i said when, when she mentioned that she is thinking of getting rid of some of her tiaras, I was like, oh, well, I, I'd be glad to rehome those for you because I had this idea that it would be interesting to create a headdress that was essentially a stack of tiaras, like the way that when, you know, of course, if you have all the storage in the world, then you want to have this, the tiaras all have their own little box and their own little drawer and stuff. But let's be real, like in theater and opera, you, you don't often have all the storage space that you might want. And, and so you get this really glamorous pile of these coronets and tiaras. And I thought, oh, well, you know, maybe if I just inherited this extra pile of tiaras that, that I could secure them together and basically make a headdress that was a stack of tiaras. So I'm not saying that's my design. Oh, welcome. I see Sydney. She is one of my former millinery students has just joined on IGTV. Um, good to see you. I'm just talking about a, an art inspiration challenge that is coming that, that I am co-sponsoring with um, the JWH millinery YouTube channel, um, where what we are going to do is um, we are going to be inspired by Phantom of the Opera, which will have its 35th anniversary in October of 2021. And so um, we, we, we're in the intervening time planning to make millinery or uh, other costume items that are inspired by Phantom of the Opera and then release videos in October about the making of those things and, and showcasing what they are. Um, so that's very exciting. Um, Sydney is liking my terminology of glamorous pile. <laughs> oh, Lucy Wakeland is here. She used to work at Playmakers long, long time ago and was head of our, well, not a long, long time ago, maybe like 10 years ago. Um, not even 10 years, no. Anyway, um, nice to see you, Lucy. Thank you for joining my stream. And let's see, uh, I can't read. My, my eyesight is so bad. Um, most unrealistic thing about Phantom is that, yes, there's all these underground channels in the, the theater that have not been taken over by costume storage or, or props. <laughs> That's that is the most unrealistic thing about Anna, Phantom of the Opera, like the idea that there are huge cavernous tunnels underneath the theater, like that is actually genuinely through, true in Paris, um, but it's 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 strains credulity to believe that they would be uh, remotely inhabitable because the Parisian sewers go through there as well. Um, I see that Arlene has joined over on um, YouTube. Hi, nice to see you. Um, she may actually also be on Instagram TV. We're down to three minutes left for the stream today. And, and I've actually managed to complete all of the projects that I had. I've, I finished my four color chip infinity scars and I finished stabilizing the trim on my Regency bonnet. There are so many people who are sort of late to the party here that I, I, I need to show this again. So previously all of this had been pinned out on the Regency bonnet, which has been so long in the making. Um, but now I, I've finally stabilized it all for the lecture that I'm giving on, basically it's on 
Regency accessories, of which bonnets are sort of the primary and iconic Regency accessory, but we'll also be talking about parasols and gloves and folding fans and reticules, which is a fancy name for little handbags. Um, and that's part of this multi-lecture series, which I'm the last of five lectures on various aspects of life in the time of Jane Austen. And some of the lectures have to do with her, uh, her novels, and some of the lectures have to do with um, costume design and film adaptations of her novels and so forth. Um, Cindy's asking, how do you say organized in terms of supplies and workspace if you have time to answer? Um, okay, well, in terms of supplies and workspace here at the house, I stay organized by... Um, I have a chest of drawers that is uh, fabric yardage folded up and in three of the drawers. And then one of the drawers is all um, spooled, goods on spools. So like elastic, twill tape, ribbon, um, you know, you name it. If it comes in a strip and is sold on a spool, it's stored in that drawer. And um, that drawer also has a couple of containers of different kinds of closures, like snaps and buttons and stuff. So, so that's sort of like my costume uh, materials storage. And then I also have two, like kind of like the lockers that you have in a, a gym or a spa. I have two lockers that have shelves inside of them and on each shelf is um, projects if, if they fit in there. I mean, obviously something like this straw bonnet has been sitting on a head. Um, there's a long shelf along one end of my home studio where there are various heads that have hats in states of construction on them. Um, and But then also another key that I have for staying organized is I have a a calendar it's it's a book you know a, a, I guess a planner they call it it's a, that it's by the month and then after each month it's by week so um, like I'll plan the whole month on the monthly calendar that they will have like these are I, I release new video every Monday these are the videos that will be released in the month of February and I stream every Thursday. And if I know what I will be streaming about, I'll, I'll write that on there. Um, and then if I need to elaborate on any of these things, when you get into the weekly pages, you have much more space to write. So I can just have like interview Lisa, you know, for example. Um, and then in the corresponding week, it'll say interview prospective graduate student Lisa Smith, which is not a prospective graduate student. That's a fake name but you know um and and i write all that stuff down because i tried keeping track of it digital <clears throat> again someone calling again someone called and preempted what i was saying um i tried keeping track of it digitally and I, I, I just totally failed because I can't, there's no way on a phone to expand your calendar to see what you have to do on what days every day of the week in a month. And so that's why I was like, I need to go back to analog because this is not helping me. Like, it's great to get a notice on my phone of like, hey, you have a stream in two hours. And, and that's helpful for staying on track in the moment. Um, but it doesn't really help me with long-term planning. And so the ever so, I didn't I didn't always have this planner. Like it's it's really been since the pandemic started and I, I my my life splintered, but it also became really insular because I almost never leave my house now. Um, that I, I realized I needed to find a way to get that big picture view on things. So I only started the planner with the year 2021. Um, previously, I had been hoping that I could rely upon my phone and a, a wall calendar that I have on next to my sewing machine in the studio. And 
that was sort of successful, but the, the planner helps immensely because I'm able to color coordinate. You know, like I have highlighters where it's like blue highlighter is things to do with class and yellow highlighter is interviewing prospective grad students. Orange highlighter is presentations that I give, you know, like this Regency thing. Um, I'm, I've come to the end of my stream. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining me today. I think this has been... Um, maybe my most successful stream in terms of being able to get everything done that I had actually planned to get done. And um, I I'm, I'm also appreciate the interaction, on, especially in the IGTV chat. Um, I, I get better chat there and I need to figure out a way to bring the phone closer so I can see it easier without having to be like somebody saying something to me. So I, I apologize again for my poor eyesight. And I believe Fingers crossed, I believe that I will be streaming every Thursday through the month of March. Um, so far, nothing has popped up on my calendar to preempt one of these. And we finish interviewing prospective grads this week, so uh, this coming week. So that definitely will not uh, preempt. So hopefully I'll see you back here next Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Well, it'll be Eastern Daylight Time next week because the time changes here in the u.s this sunday well saturday night at two o'clock in the morning i think um so don't forget to turn your clocks ahead spring forward and uh yes i'll see you back here hopefully next thursday if you want to join me for open studio stream thank you so much for attending and i'll catch you next week oops